In this race for the White House, I am the law and order candidate. We're in Chicago, as the future of policing all over the country is about to enter a new era. With the election of Donald Trump, a man who showed himself to be firmly on the side of law enforcement. The problem in our poorest communities is not that there are too many police. The problem is that there are not enough police. But this is a city still reeling from the deaths of men and women killed by police. On October 20th, 2014, Laquan McDonald was running away from police when Officer Jason Van Dyke arrived at the scene. Almost immediately, the officer began firing into the 17-year-old's body, one shot after another, as he lay injured and dying. Van Dyke shot him 16 times. Puffs of smoke could be seen rising from his body. Police dashcam video caught the shooting, but the city kept it buried for more than a year. Before the world could see what really happened, the police came up with their own story. On the night of the shooting, a spokesman for the police union told journalists that McDonald had lunged towards the officer with a knife when he was killed. He is a very serious threat to the officers, and he leaves them no choice at that point but to defend themselves. But the union's role in what was allowed to happen that night goes beyond spinning the story, to the very heart of its contract with the city, one that critics say institutionalizes a code of silence and prioritizes special protections for police over justice and accountability for those who die at their hands. The truth about what happened to Laquan McDonald may have never come out if it wasn't for one man, a civil rights lawyer who spent years representing victims of police violence. Craig Futterman agreed to meet us at the Burger King near the site of the shooting. Futterman first heard about the tape of the shooting from someone inside the Chicago Police Department. I got a call. Um, it all started with a tip from someone inside law enforcement who was just fed up. They'd seen the videotape and they were concerned that it would get buried like other police shootings, that nothing would happen. Since the shooting, there's been allegations of a cover-up. More than just allegations of a cover-up, there was a cover-up. Immediately after the shooting, all the police officers on the scene knew what to do, and that was to circle the wagons and to cover it up. And the whole world has now gotten to see Chicago's machinery of denial and action. Every officer on the scene lied either backed up Officer Van Dyke's story or told another false story that even though, including the woman who was sitting right in the front seat, 16 shots lasted for like a few slot for like 14 or more seconds, I never looked up. I saw nothing. It seems very clear that there was close corroboration about how to tell the story. If you look at what each officer said, they'll have very similar stories. The lies are... all matched, yeah. Right. The detectives then who arrive on the scene, they're ordinary people who saw what happened. And instead of give me your name, give me your number, let me speak with you, it was get the hell out of here. And a couple witnesses didn't. And one of them who didn't, a woman, and she reports the detectives took her down to the station, locked her up in a room, and held her against her will for, she says, hours, and intimidated her and told her that she didn't see what she saw. So you're basically talking about police falsifying reports, yeah. lying, um, threatening and intimidating witnesses. The officers on the scene, they were doing exactly what was expected of them. People talk about the code of silence as though it's a phenomenon of silence, and I don't know that that's exactly right. What it's really about is about lying. It's about creating an official narrative, and if you go against the official narrative, you get crushed.
After the McDonald tape was released, Chicago's mayor, Rahm Emanuel, faced questions about how the police could lie and expect to get away with it. Those questions went all the way to the top. The mayor was accused of his own cover-up. There was speculation that he didn't want to release the tape because he was worried about his re-election. Under pressure, Emanuel appointed a task force to study police training, oversight, and accountability. One of the areas it looked at was the police union's contracts with the city, and its conclusions were scathing. We went into the process thinking that the code of silence was just this unwritten agreement among police officers to protect one another. And what we found was that the contract itself institutionalizes these private understandings among police officers that make it harder to identify and root out bad behavior. The task force criticized a key provision in the contract, dictating when police officers can be questioned after a shooting. The union says officers need a cooling off period. And when they were challenged by a police oversight agency in 2010, an arbitrator ruled in their favor. Provision 3C says in part that the shooting members will be required to give their statement to IPRA no earlier than 24 hours after the shooting incident. So you say in the reports that this essentially makes it easier for officers to lie. If we allow a lot of time to pass, after something happens, and if we allow people to talk to one another about it, their stories might align, even if they have perfectly good intentions. Worst case scenario is that time period basically gives them an opportunity to concoct and to collude. The latter case you're describing sounds exactly like Laquan McDonald. Uh, if you read the sworn statements of the officers who were on the scene, they're remarkably similar. If we believe that having a traumatic experience like this is going to cloud your memory, why don't we do all interviews of witnesses or people who were charged with a crime after we've let time pass? It almost seems like there's a different set of rules for police officers and a set of rules for everybody else. We ask police officers to carry guns and go into dangerous situations and, uh, and take a lot of risks. Uh, so we might want to provide protections for them. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be holding them accountable for bad behavior. If there's any case that reveals the potential hazards of the 24-hour rule, it's Laquan McDonald's and what happened in the hours, days, and months that followed. An investigation by Chicago's local NBC News channel found that police allegedly deleted footage from the Burger King cameras. The police denied this, but we wanted to hear about what happened for ourselves. We called the chain's district manager, but he didn't want to be filmed. Like a lot of people involved in the case, he's reluctant to speak publicly, but he agreed to meet with us. Okay, so he says that after the Laquan McDonald shooting, several officers came into the Burger King and stayed for several hours. And he says they deleted over 80 minutes of footage from before, during, and after the shooting from all the cameras, both inside and outside the Burger King. And he says he believes they did it to hide evidence, and he called it a crime. Despite the police's denials, the manager also told us there's no other way the footage could have disappeared, and that nothing like that had ever happened before. He testified before a federal grand jury investigating the shooting. Since the McDonald case went public, the Chicago Police Department has been sensitive to scrutiny. It's not easy to get interviews with officers. So when we were driving and saw a large group of them, we stopped to see if anyone would talk to us. A veteran officer was eager to share his perspective, but he didn't want his identity shown. We talked about the Laquan McDonald shooting, and he said he believes officers were coached by higher-ups in the detective division on what to say when they filed their police reports. So this is an experienced police officer saying he believes there was a cover-up. That belief shared by many in Chicago, sparked a full investigation by the city's inspector general. He found that Jason Van Dyke and other officers did make false statements in their official reports and to investigators, 
they're now facing multiple charges. According to local reports, top brass are also suspected of lying, and the investigation is far from over. When people in Chicago talk about a code of silence, it's not just about officers covering for each other. They describe a culture they say also discourages whistleblowers from coming forward. In their report, the mayor's task force once again pointed to the police union contract. They criticized a provision that says police who provide information in officer-involved shootings can't be rewarded, making it harder to encourage officers to report misconduct. In many ways, Shannon Spaulding's story is a cautionary tale of what can happen to police whistleblowers. Hi, Sha. Hi. In 2007, she began investigating fellow officers accused of corruption. We met her at the main site of her investigation, a housing project that was torn down several years ago. This is where Sergeant Ronald Watts and Kalat Mohammed and the and company and the crew, the TAC team, basically orchestrated their extortion, implementing the tax on the drug dealers and all the alleged crimes that go along with the Operation Brass Tax. So you were investigating him undercover? Yes. Ronnie Watts would say to a drug dealer, you're going to pay me X amount of money every week for you to be able to continue to sell your narcotics without fear of penalty or persecution or being arrested. And they would comply and they would go ahead and, and pay that. And if they didn't, they were arrested. So there was false arrest. Narcotics were allegedly planted on individuals that were innocent. The investigation was, in my opinion, incomplete. It was cut short. Shannon began to suspect that the police department was sabotaging her investigation, which she and her partner were conducting along with the FBI. She says they were on the verge of breaking the case open when the chief of internal affairs revealed their undercover identities and outed them as rats. And after you were exposed, uh, what happened? What was the reaction within the department towards you? I was told that if I entered the building that I would be arrested. I was told that I couldn't even come inside to use the bathroom. It was said that I could piss outside with the rest of the rats. I had my life threatened. I was told by one of my direct supervisors that he warned me that I should wear my bulletproof vest coming and going from my personal car, walking through the police facility parking lot because the bosses that I had made mad were so mad that if they could shoot me across the parking lot, they would. I was arrested on trumped up, completely erroneous charges. Um, that I was illegally recording a supervisor of mine and then played the recording for a coworker. They said if, if four bosses say it happened, it happened and you can't prove otherwise. And in that moment, in that instant, I knew the power that they had over me. I was told the Chicago Police Department didn't respond to a list of questions we sent them. Shannon and her partner filed a lawsuit against the city, saying they suffered retaliation for investigating fellow officers. When you were going through all of this, uh, did the union support you in any way? I was just told, good luck, you're on your own with your lawsuit. And so I felt completely defeated when I left there. Like, I had no department, and I left there realizing I had no union because I was a whistleblower. In May, on the same day her trial was going to begin, the city settled for $2 million. In the end, Sergeant Watts and his partner were convicted of stealing money from an FBI informant. But Shannon says her investigation could have uncovered a lot more had it been allowed to continue. It's almost when you walk through here now, it's just this world never existed. Just like all the rubble has been cleared away and, and everything is covered up with the grass, the same thing with the investigation. It's almost like everything's been hauled away and it's all been covered up. The city of Chicago has released 135,000 complaints that have been lodged against police dating back to 1967. According to an analysis by the Chicago Sun-Times, a very small percent of officers actually faced serious discipline. The records were released after a long court battle led by journalist Jamie Calvin. 
He's been reporting on Chicago police for 20 years. So you sued the city to get access to these disciplinary records. Um, the union fought you every step of the way. Can you talk about uh, the process and how you got all of this stuff released? Yeah, so the Illinois Appellate Court in 2014 ruled in Calvin versus Chicago that fundamentally these documents, the police misconduct, files, investigations, belong to the public. This is quintessential public information. The police union intervened, arguing that a release of that information would be a violation of their contract, which provides that police misconduct records are only to be retained for certain periods, I think between five and seven years, depending on the nature of the complaint. This was a provision of the contract that the mayor's task force also criticized, saying it should be removed entirely. At every stage and every moment in that process, the union fought. The, um, the release of this information, but more fundamentally, they fought the retention of it. And we're not just talking about putting it in a warehouse somewhere, we're talking about actually destroying these documents. Before this latest release, Jamie received more than 56,000 complaints against police, which he and his team turned into a searchable database. But that's a shocking number that it's 56,000 um, Complaints, and they're all individual people's stories, and 96% of them are unsustained. Yeah, but the other thing that, that's critical to understanding these issues is here's a heat map of the city. So, you know, the most concentrated colors are where most of the complaints are coming from. And if you know Chicago at all, this is the African-American South Side, and this is the African-American West Side. So the most marginalized areas of the city are the ones that are subject to the most police abuse. Right. The data shows that while African Americans filed most of the complaints, those made by white residents were much more likely to be upheld. And this is the great challenge we face, is that nothing confers impunity more than the social status of the victim. So here's what's possible with the database. You can just put in an officer's name. Right, you know, right away we have Van Dyke. 20 complaints. Zero discipline. Zero discipline. So again, there's a whole period of his career, essentially a decade, where we don't have information. But for the last five years, or six years now, we do. According to the records, the officer who killed Laquan McDonald had a history of complaints, including allegations that he used racial slurs. If you just you know scroll down what we know about these complaints, use of force found to be unfounded. Use of force, not sustained. Verbal abuse, um, not sustained. Use of force, unfounded. Hmm. So this is what he's accused of in this one. Choking the complainant during a traffic stop. So this is all Jason Van Dyke. Yeah. When you have these patterns of the same forms of misconduct being alleged again and again and again, there's some weight there. There's some reason to look to to intervene, to find out what's going on. And had somebody looked at it, we might not know the name Laquan McDonald because he would be alive and walking the streets of the city. This is a system designed for not connecting dots. And the union is a defender of that system. And the union contract not only undermines police accountability, but it harms the public safety. If you look at the data, this is a very concentrated set of patterns. It's a small subset of officers that generates a large number of complaints. Wouldn't the department want to make sure that these officers aren't casting a pall over the rest of the department if they're problematic? If they're problematic, then it's the department's job to address that. And that's the department's job. You know, you'd have to ask them. The, no, I, I, the argument is by, by destroying, that we protect this, them. The, destroying this valuable information, you can maybe not recognize these patterns? My keyword value, you know, I'm not sure about the value on old complaints and a necessity to a 1967 allegation against an officer at 77, 79 years old needs to be on record right now. But the public needs to know so the public gets to know and see everything. Do you think there's a code of silence in the department? There's a code of silence everywhere. Everybody has it. When we have people in the clergy, that are uh, sexually assaulting young kids or, or people in seminaries and others know about it and they just transfer them? Is there a code of silence there? Is there? 
There is, but sure that doesn't make it right. That makes it very no, wrong. No, but you, so why would this profession be any different? But so it's something that needs to change in your opinion. I don't think anybody in this day and age, anybody that does anything that jeopardizes the livelihood of their job for their family to stand up for somebody that they know is doing something they shouldn't be doing is, is silly. Do you think the contract bargains away accountability and transparency? Our bargaining agreement protects the livelihood and the working conditions of police officers. I can't be concerned about the transparency or the accountability that the department wants or the city wants. Well, let me ask you, what if uh, the city takes the task force recommendations to heart and tries to implement them? Bring the checkbook. That's what I told the lawyer for the city. What did you mean, bring the checkbook? If they want something out of our contract, they're going to pay for it. The city of Chicago first signed the collective bargaining agreement with the police union in 1981. Since then, the Fraternal Order of Police in the city made a deal of sorts. Give police more protections in exchange for paying salaries the city could afford. Now there's public pressure on the city to renegotiate the contract to remove some of those protections. We love partnering with the mayor. Um, but it'll be up to the mayor to make that happen. Emmanuel, hi. Are you going to renegotiate the parts of the police union contract that your own task force okay. says institutionalize a code of silence? Deal with that. <laughs> Sir, but I'm his first secretary. He's not taking questions off. today. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He's not taking questions. Today. To mayor, just a quick question. Just. He doesn't want to answer any questions. Uh, as soon as he heard me talk about uh, anything to do with the police, he kind of gave me a little nudge, and uh, his people came in the way. So he clearly doesn't want to talk about it. In Chicago, the name Laquan McDonald has become shorthand for a lot of things. Police killings and cover-ups, a city trying to bury a controversial story, and the mistrust between police and the communities they're sworn to protect. Chico Tillman worked at Laquan School when he was a student there. What was he like? Jovial, very, very, very playful, a little bit on the childish side. He loved to play, he loved, loved to laugh, loved to goof off. Um, wasn't aggressive at all. When I initially saw the, the video and I saw him, he posed no threat because he wasn't even running away. He was skipping away and being playful. That's the Laquan I knew. There's been a lot of focus on this case, on Laquan McDonald shooting. A lot of it is focused on police and uh, corruption within the police force. But uh, people rarely talk about who he was. If you see here, he was a brother. He loved his family. This is Laquan as the jokester. You know, he was a kid in a very tough world, a very tough situation. If his life was a poker hand, uh, he, he didn't have a good hand. But he had a great poker face. He was upbeat. Uh, if he could help you, he would help you. He was the kind of guy, if he had done something wrong to you, he would say he was sorry. You know, and try to find a way to make you laugh, you know, to get it over with. I think about him, and, you know, and how he died alone on the same street that I lived on, on a street that I have to drive down every day. No one should have to die that way, no one. For those who knew Laquan, the alleged cover-up that followed his shooting has made the loss even harder to accept. That's the part that broke my heart to see so many people cooperating his story, where you have the code of silence and you setting a bad example for us because you're condoning what the police officer did by cooperating a lie. Let's just call it what it is. They cooperated a lie. The Department of Justice is conducting a civil rights investigation into the Chicago Police Department. But with the election of Donald Trump, it's unclear what will come of it. Whatever happens, there's fear in the community here that under President Trump, law enforcement will be more powerful than ever. I have a message to every last person threatening the peace on our streets and the safety of our police. When I take the oath of office next year, I will restore law and order to our country. 
The war on our police must end, and it must end now.